If you're joining us through Facebook Live or podcast or YouTube, we certainly are happy you're with us this hour in our time of Bible study. In Hebrews chapter 7, the verses that I'd like to get through tonight is 1 through 10, but I, I'm not sure we'll get that far, but we'll go as far as the Lord uh, has us go. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of the brethren, at, that is, of their brethren, though they came, or though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may say so, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship where you have brought us to be with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, thank you, Lord, for that you hear our prayers and the, the prayers and the love of all of your children. Father, may you bless your word tonight as we open up this portion and search your word diligently. Father, may you just open our hearts and our minds to it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we will be going a little bit deeper tonight with the Melchizedek. I mean, actually, he started the subject of Melchizedek in chapter 5. And if you remember, he had an intermission of, you know, before I go into the deep things about Melchizedek, he encouraged us to spiritually mature. And that was where we kind of left off. It was this long intermission in between those things. But here, the writer, I mean, the writer of Hebrews, when he is bringing up Melchizedek, the Melchizedekian priesthood, and when I say that, that's who I mean, Melchizedekian uh, priesthood, when he brings him up as the king, he is comparing his priesthood with Jesus' priesthood and then Levi, the Levitical priesthood. So when I say Levitical priesthood, I'm talking about Levi, who was one of the 12 children of Israel, and the, the Levites were dedicated to the service of God. The, the sacrifices, the priestly offices were all of Levi, of the 12 children. So when I say Levitical priesthood, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I may even call it the, the order of Aaron. Uh, so bringing those kind of two things up, but when he's bringing up Melchizedek in here, I, I believe he's wanting to explain the, that there is a difference in the eternal versus the temporary and to give confidence and hope to not just the Hebrews but to us of Jesus Christ's priesthood. Now you remember back in chapter, actually all the way back in chapter uh, 2, he at the end of it, you don't have to turn there, but he had talked about Jesus being our faithful and high priest and things containing to Jesus. Now, we need this common thread as we go back. Now, remember what he was talking about with, with Jesus being in the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood of Melchizedek. He had just in chapter 5, if you look back at verse, let's see, chapter 5, verse 6. As he saith also in another place, 
Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, now he's talking about Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience, he learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect. Now if you remember, we talked about that. He he was perfected. The things which Jesus suffered, the things with the obedience which Jesus had, the doing the will of the Lord in perfect obedience, perfect righteousness, and in suffering, he was perfected. He became the author of salvation unto all them that obey him. And in verse 10, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So one of the, the thread that we want to go to, now he stopped there. If you remember, he was right in the middle of this thought. And then he stopped and started talking about spiritual maturity. And in chapter 7, verse 1, he picks it right back up with Melchizedek. So the common thread here that we need to keep in mind is that Jesus qualified to be our great and high priest. He was perfected. The things which Jesus experienced, the things which Jesus did, the suffering which he did in perfect obedience in the will of the Lord, and being our substitute in all of the life which he had to live to be our perfect substitute, he also was perfected in his priesthood. He, he could offer up himself as a sacrifice, and he could pass into the heavens forever, and that is the priesthood which Jesus is after, is Melchizedek. So in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 7, he goes to explain to us Melchizedek, exactly who he was. He, it's kind of a setup and then a delivery. The setup is in verses 1 through 3 of the Melchizedekian priesthood. And we're going to look at a couple things. I, honestly, tonight I was praying. I don't know if we'll get past verse 3. There's, there's a lot in here. Um, and, then chap, and then verses 4 through 10 is the delivery of consider how great this man is. Consider how great this Melchizedek really is. And then let's look at the three ways uh, which he is greater. Now... Before we, there is some prep work that I want to do before we start in right away with Melchizedek because we need to understand the Levitical priesthood. We need to understand just a little bit the types. Now, I know I've probably brought this up before, but a type is a person, a place, a ceremony, uh, whatever it may be that's in the Old Testament that pictures something else. The something else is the antitype. So it could be a fulfillment. Uh, the things which are in, like, for example, the brazen serpent in Numbers. Now, the, we know that the brazen serpent was a type of Christ. When Moses lifted up the serpent, all those looked to him, the, the serpent lived. Now, let me ask you something. If I were to go find that same exact brazen serpent, and I were to lift it up, just like they did in the Old Testament, would it do anything? No, because it was a type of Christ. Christ fulfilled the type. There's no longer a need for the type. Yeah. So the, the anti-type's eternal. The type is temporary. The type was always meant to be temporary and in many cases was imperfect to do what Jesus would do. Jesus is the perfect. He perfected the type. Uh, the same thing as the Lamb of God. Uh, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. We know that uh, Jesus is the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that they sacrificed in the Old Testament, the Lamb that they kept sacrificing over and over was a type of Jesus. And when Jesus came and became the Lamb of God, that type is no longer necessary. I mean, if we were to go find a lamb and sacrifice it right here, do you think God would receive that sacrifice for forgiveness of sins? No, no, not at all. Uh, so we understand that the types in the old were temporary by nature. By design, God made those things temporary. Okay, so one thing we do need to know about the Hebrews, and we're going to get in the mind of the Hebrew a little bit, is 
the priesthood, the sacrifice was everything. The sacrifice meant everything to them. Okay, so uh, when they, in the entire focal point was the priesthood, no forgiveness of sins was offered. I mean, the obedience to the law was good, but the sacrifices were imperative to the Hebrews. And at this time, there's still a temple, there's still sacrifice going on, and there's still a priest. All right, now there's things that we want to know about the Levitical priesthood. First of all, the every tribe or, or the entire tribe of Levi was dedicated for God for religious service. So in order to be a priest in the Old Testament, you had to be from the tribe of Levi and you had to be actually from Aaron. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But it, it was all based on the bloodline all based on the bloodline. So the genealogies had to be up to date. They had to keep all of those records in check. Secondly, the Levites were not royal. There was no royal blood that came from the Levites. They were subject to the king, just as everybody else was subject to the king. Now, the king did not interfere with the Levitical priestly office, but they were still subject to the king. So nor did they own land. Uh, the Levites had to receive tithes uh, from the other 11 tribes of Israel. Third, the, the priestly sacrifice, including the one that he did at the Day of Atonement, is not permanent. There was never a once for all. They, it was not perpetual. They had to keep going. There was never a complete forgiveness of sins. There was never a complete uh, forgiveness of trespasses. There was never complete peace in the Old Testament with those sacrifices. Fourth, as I said, the Levitical priesthood was hereditary. If you were in the bloodline, uh, then you qualified to be a priest. If you were a son of Aaron, and even more than just being in the, the Levites, you had to be a son of Aaron. You had to trace your bloodline back to Aaron to be a Levitical priest. Um, it did not so much have to do with the personal qualification but just the genealogy. That's all that it mattered. And fifth, the priestly service was temporary. You could only be a priest between the age of 25 and 50. After 25 years, you're out. 25 years of service, and when, once you hit 50, you're done. You, you have stopped being a priest. So remembering that those that, that'll help us as we start looking in verses 1 through 3 because uh, we want to observe some differences between the Melchizedekian priesthood and the Levitical priesthood. So let's start at verse 1. Now remember, Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's probably the biggest takeaway. Jesus is not a priest after the order of Aaron. He is not a Levitical priest. He was born of the bloodline of Judah from both, I mean, from, well, from Mary particularly, but as the headship, Joseph. Joseph and Mary were distant relatives, all, both from the line of Judah, the, the kingly tribe. Jesus was not born from the Levitical tribe. And it's actually really good that he was not because Jesus is never to be a priest after the order of Aaron, after the order of the Levitical priests, because there were issues, and we're getting ready to learn about those. Verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. Now, verses 1 through 3 is, is basically a summary of Genesis chapter 14. Uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 14. Now, we won't read the entire chapter. The, the, I'll just kind of summarize the first uh, 10 verses. You definitely, actually, if you've been reading the Bible, you've already uh, met this and went on, the Genesis 22. So um, I, I'm going to... I, for two days, I've been practicing this name, but I still can't get it right, so I'm not going to read this name. <laughs> Actually, I might. I might. I don't know. But um, the, the issue was is you had four kings. You, this is called the Battle of the Kings. You had, five, you had five kings versus four kings. And the 
four kings, actually look at verse 1. All right, I'm going to read it. I'm going to go for it. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of uh, Eleazar, and this is the one, uh, Kedorlamir, king of Elam, that one is bad, and uh, Tidal, king of nations. You know, I was thinking as I was pronouncing that king's name, uh, Kedorlamir, I was like, if, if I were in the presence of that king and said it like that, he'd be like, off with his head. I'd, I'd be a dead man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, these kings, and these, uh, these are the four kings, these made war with Barak, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Sh uh, Shemeber, king of Zobium, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedalermir, and in the 13th year they rebelled. And in the 14th year uh, came Kedor Lemer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephims and Ashtaroth, Carneum, and the Zurims and Ham, and in the Emons and Sheva and Carathium, and the Horites and their Mount Seir and Elephran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Enmishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazan Tamar. Now, in case, and I know it's, it's easy to kind of lose the, the, the narrative with all these names. The four kings uh, went to war against the five kings, and the four kings pretty much whooped them, okay? And the five kings included the kings of Sodom and the kings of Gomorrah. And at that time, Lot was living in Sodom. In verse 8, and there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zor, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim, with Kador Lemir, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew for he dwelt in the plain of Mer, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Anir. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house 318 and pursued them unto Dan and he divided himself against them he and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Haba which is on the left hand of Damascus and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedor Lemir and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shiva, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek. So here comes Melchizedek, king of Salem. He's not been mentioned one time so far. He's not been one of the kings. Neither is Salem. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. I want you to... Uh, realize that the most high God, we're going to talk about that in a minute. That's not Jehovah, Jehovah. That is not one of the other names of God. It is actually Elron. And when they use that name for God, it's always the most high God. It's the most high. Elron, El Elron is the most high God. And it's the universal name for God. It's not just Israel's name for God. Israel had Many, there's many names uh, with God. Jehovah was their covenant. That God was their covenant God. It was Israel's God. But when it talks in reference of the God of the Most High, that is without restriction of nation. That's, he's, that's a universal name for God. And verse 19, And he, Melchizedek, blessed Abraham, him, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. 
Uh, Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, now there's a different king, Sodom, uh, Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, he uses Jehovah there, the most high God, and he uses El Elron there, the possessor of heaven and earth that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Anar, Eshkol, and Mamir, let them take their portion. So um, as a side note, just, just real quick, you would think Lot would have took the hint by now to get out of Sodom. And Abram's not even receiving gifts from Sodom. He's like, no, I don't want your blood money. I don't want your gambling money. I don't want your, your sin wicked money. And you think Lot would be like, you know what? I, I don't know. And then later on is when we have Sodom and Gomorrah. But now we have uh, come back to Hebrews chapter 7. There's only three places in the whole Bible that even mentions Melchizedek. This was one of them, Genesis chapter 14. The next one is Psalm 110, and King David is talking about Melchizedek. And then Hebrews, right here. Hebrews chapter 7 is the most detailed information that we have of, of Melchizedek throughout the word of God. Now, some speculate about Melchizedek because there's such a mystery about him. Uh, there's... He was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither of those things. So some speculate and say that Melchizedek was an angel who took on human flesh. But I don't think that it's an angel because what was the requirement of being a priest? Was being human. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained. So that's the first thing. I don't believe Melchizedek is an, is an angel. Uh, some will say that Melchizedek was actually a Christophany, was actually Jesus that had pre-incarnate, had come and he had dwelt in the flesh, and that was actually Jesus who was Melchizedek. But I don't believe it is Jesus either, because in verse 3, if look at, Chapter 7, verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. It didn't say he was the Son of God. He was made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest forever. And the second reason I don't think it's Jesus is because so far he has dealt so much in types that Jesus is the better Moses, he's the better Aaron, He's the, the, the better uh, priest. So we see that him kind of dealing with type so far. I believe Melchizedek was an actual human person who lived in history that God has intentionally kept certain things hidden from us. He's, he's a mystery to us. And it's all about the priesthood. It's not so much about the man it's about the priesthood. So there's certain things, there's certain gaps. You notice there's no genealogy. We have no record of his birth or his death. So I believe Melchizedek was a man who God had appointed at a time to be all these things just to be the type that would come of Jesus Christ. And God does that all the time, doesn't he? And isn't it wonderful that God is a God of details? And Everything in your life is a detail that does not escape God's eyes. I mean, uh, I believe I was talking to Sister Harriet a long time ago, and I do this too, and I don't know if you all do this, but if I can't find my keys and I need to leave, I'll pray. Lord, help me find my keys. And I'll find my keys. Or, Lord, uh, help me to remember that I need to do this. Or, or, you know, and just that daily conversation with the Lord. No too small a detail. And, and then you hear people, you know, talking, well, God's too busy to listen to me. And, and these are supposed to be confessed Christians. And, and I'm like, that's, that's not a relationship. That, that's, that's, you know, that's not our Lord and our God. I, and I pray for them that they actually do know him. Um, 
because he is an ever-present help. <laughs> He's an ever-present presence. Um, but I believe God has designed the Melchizedek to remain a mystery in this way. Now, I want to look at five comparisons just in verses 1 through 3. That's why I don't think we may get out of 1 through 3. The comparisons that we can make. I, we went over Levitical priesthood, what, what was all involved with the priesthood with Levi. And we went over, up to this point, Jesus, we see, had qualified personally to be our great high priest, our Savior. All of the sufferings he went through, the obedience he went through, he qualified to be our Savior. And so, um, verse 1, again, we already talked about that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But he was a priest of the Most High God. Now, that El Elyon, as we had said, is a universal name of God. And actually, um, I got that from John MacArthur. And it's interesting because you see that it... You see the Most High God in different places in the Old Testament, and he, he just made the observation that this is a universal name of God. The God of the Hebrews, Jehovah, was a God of their nation. And Melchizedek, if he comes in and he says that he is the God of the whole world. Now, you've got to remember, Jesus is not just Israel's Messiah. He's the whole world's Messiah. He is the one who would come to take away my sins. So he's the entire world. He's a lot bigger than the nation of Israel. Le the Levitical priesthood was very nation specific. The Levitical priesthood was only Israel. Where the priesthood of Melchizedek was outside of the nation of Israel. I mean he was talking to Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. So he was definitely outside of that Levitical priesthood, and he uses the Most High God in reference. Now, what does that mean? It means that Jesus' priesthood is universal. Now, significant to the Jews is, is this fact. Here, it is bringing up, whom, and that's what it says in verse 1. Look at verse 2. Who, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Abraham gave t uh, tithes to Melchizedek. So to the Hebrew, now imagine being a Jew and hearing this, this comparison. Um, they've only known the, Le the Levitical priesthood. Remember how focal point they are in the priesthood, the, in the sacrifices? Everything was about the sacrifices to the Jew. Everything, the temple, everything was about it. Like I said, the law was good to obey, but they had to have the sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. So everything was about the priesthood to the Jew. Now, here comes the idea that, no, Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, consider Melchizedek. Think about him. Uh, he was a priest outside of the nation of Israel. And not only that, not only does Jesus... Uh, replace the Levitical priesthood, but he predates them. Yeah. Melchizedek was before the Levitical priesthood. I mean, Le uh, Melchizedek bumped into Abraham, the father of the Levitical priesthood. So Jesus' priesthood predates that of Aaron's priesthood. So imagine being a Jew and hearing that. I mean, they're I mean, everything in their world was about the priesthood, and now they're saying, well, Jesus is a priest after the order of Aaron, or after the order of Melchizedek. Secondly, Melchizedek was a king. He was a royal priest. Now, remember what I had said before. The Levites did not have land. They did not have rulership. They came under rulership. They weren't allowed to rule. But Melchizedek is a king. And so that's a big difference between the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedekian priesthood in the fact that he is both king and priest and typifying Jesus as both king and priest. Now, remember what we had talked about with the genealogy of Jesus. He was born of the tribe of Judah. 
So he was born in the bloodline of a king. And that is important, that he was born of that, that, that bloodline because of prophecy. But Jesus was not born after uh, the priesthood. And so we see that, that his kingship came from Judah, but his priesthood did not come from Levi. It came from the Melchizedekian priesthood. And as we keep going, uh, Jesus uh, uh, typifies our king priest because one, he's our priest, he's our, he intercedes for us, and two, he's our king and talks to his lordship. So that was significant. Now, in verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Now that tenth part is interesting. In the Hebrew, tithe means tenth. It translates to tenth. So Abraham gave a tenth part. He gave a tithe of all. First, being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. The name Melchizedek is interpreted king of righteousness. That's what the word Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. And, and it says king of uh, I'm sorry, and after that, also king of Salem, which many of you all know means Jerusalem. It also means peace in the Hebrew, uh, Selah, the, the, or Shalom. So king of peace, which is king of peace. So uh, we don't think the significance here is Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem. The significance here is the Melchizedek, or a pre-Jerusalem, before, you know, the, the children went in, um, was a king of righteousness and a king of peace. So what does that mean? The Levitical priesthood, the whole purpose was to present the people to God, but they could never provide righteousness. There was never a perfect uh, peace with the whole system of Levitical priests. And look at chapter 10, verse 1 with me. Chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscious of sins. So, and in verse 3, sorry, let me keep going. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So here we see the Melchizedekian priest was a king of righteousness and a king of peace. The Levitical priest, the, the whole priesthood, not only were they not royal, not only were they not kings, but they could not, with all those sacrifices, they could never produce a lasting, long-lasting righteousness or peace. And here we see that's exactly, that's the uh, characteristics of Melchizedek. And also we saw that the Aaron, the priests after the order of Aaron had to actually offer their own sin sacrifices for their own sins. Only Jesus Christ. Now, I, I want to say this. We know Melchizedek was a man. He wasn't an angel or he wasn't a Christophany. He wasn't Christ incarnate. He wasn't all of these things. He was still a man. So we know that he had faults just like us. That he was a sinner just like us. But it was God who appointed the priesthood it was God who had appointed the type of Melchizedek to be the king of righteousness, the king of peace. We understand that. And Jesus is the antitype. He's a fulfillment of Melchizedek. Uh, and we're going to get in here a little bit. Like I said, it's a little bit deep. I, I, we're we're going to be deep a little bit, but then I want to come back and look at some, some, some big things that will encourage you tonight. But as we look at Melchizedek, we need to see that it says that he was the king of righteousness and after that the king of peace. Jesus is the only priest king who can provide both righteousness and peace perfectly, permanently, and forever. The priests after the order of Levi could not do that. 
they could bring your sins up to the, the sacrifice once a year, that you could bring up the sins, and they, they would be the mediator between God and or between man and God, and then but there was never a completion, there was never a fulfillment, there was never full righteousness, never enduring righteousness, never enduring conscience, never enduring peace. The peace which Jesus Christ brings, he brings because of his righteousness. And we are justified by faith. Justified means we've been declared righteous. You know that we are perfectly righteous in the eyes of God, that Jesus has done a perfect work of righteousness, an enduring work of righteousness, and an eternal work of righteousness. It'll never have to be renewed. It's always, always good. And he has imputed that righteousness. That's what justification is. That we've been declared righteous. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So Christ's righteousness brought the peace. He's the king of righteousness, and Jesus is the king of peace. Those two things, that's the only way to have peace. True peace must have righteousness. That's it. You cannot have peace with God and not have righteousness. And so we see that Melchizedek was the priest after uh, being the king priest. Now, number three, in verse three, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. The Levitical priesthood, now if you remember, they solely depended upon genealogy. Now think about this. Even when it had nothing to do with personal qualification, think about Aaron's sons being the priests. Think about Eli's sons being the priests. There was not a personal qualification. They got the job because of who their dad was. It was a, all about genealogy with the Levitical priesthood. It was only about genealogy. Think about in Nehemiah when they came back to, to build the walls. And uh, I don't exactly remember where it is, but uh, there were many who were trying, who wanted to become priests, but they could not find their names in the genealogy. And they said, nope, you cannot be a priest. You're not in the line of, of Aaron. You're not in this line. But look at this, without father, without mother, I do not believe he is talking literally about this man, Melchizedek. I believe he is saying, this man did live. We don't know much about him. But more importantly, what's being shown to us here is there's no record of his genealogy. There's no record of his birth. There's no record of his death. There's no record of his dad, of his mom. There's no record. There's no, this priesthood has no genealogy. This priesthood relies only on the quality of the priest. And that's what in chapter 5 he was ramping up to. Jesus qualified to be our priest, our great high priest, after all the things he did. And so uh, I believe in verse 3, that's really what he's talking about. And he says, made like unto the Son of God, which Jesus uh, you know, we know that Jesus pre-existed. He had, when we know he was born, he was the incarnation. But the matter of fact here is what he's saying is Jesus, Jesus had no priestly genealogy and he didn't need one. Yeah. The Levitical priests, they had genealogy, but they needed it. I mean, it's all by God's command. It wasn't, you know, it's was something that God had them do. He's the one that ordained the, the, the priesthood of Levi. But in Melchizedek, there was no record of his genealogy. So, of, of course, uh, Jesus' genealogy, like I said before, of him being of Judah is very important for prophecy. Um, but we see here that at the end of verse 3, he really hits this, these words right here at the end of verse 3 is really a sustained theme throughout the rest. Actually, he's going to talk about, Mel we're going to be talking about Melchizedek for a few weeks because it's chapter 7, chapter 8, uh, and then uh, it goes on from there. But he really is bringing out, like I said at the very beginning, this idea and this concept that he is a priest continually. 
it, it's eternal priesthood. It does not change. It does not, he does not cease. He does not have a term of office. It is continually. He does not die. And so did Melchizedek didn't either. According to our records, <laughs> he did not die. So Melchizedek's priesthood is eternal, not temporary. Uh, like we had said, it was 25 years. Uh, they only had 25 years. So look at verse 24 with me, and then we'll be done. And this, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests who offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. is it beautiful? It's beautiful the way that the writer of Hebrews, the Lord, had brought out to these Hebrews, to the Jews, and to us today, the comparisons, just the observable comparisons is what we saw. In verses 4 through 10, he's actually going to bring out three ways himself of how the Melchizedekian priesthood is greater than the priesthood after the order of Aaron. But what we looked at today is Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. His priesthood is universal. It's not just the nation of Israel, it's all. His priesthood is royal. He is the king priest. His priesthood, he is the, the king of righteousness and he is the king of peace. And he's qualified. Jesus did not become our priest through genealogy like those of Aaron. But he qualified himself. He perfected himself to be our faithful and high priest. And last, he's eternal. Not like the Levitical priesthood. Uh, not just he himself, but also the sacrifice is eternal, which Jesus made. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, thank you for your word, how rich, how wonderful it is. Father, we, we thank you that... Our Savior is so gracious and so wonderful and is our high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. How he's continually in your presence and in the throne room. Father, thank you, Lord, for the study which we've had tonight to look into this, to see that he has an unchanging priesthood. And, and Father, the differences between the types that you gave in the Old Testament that all point to our Lord and Savior. And in him we trust and thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.